Welcome back and thank you for joining us for Two Steps Forward, our daily Bible study in which we're looking to advance our relationship with Christ uh, two steps at a time, I guess, <laughs> is the name. <laughs> no, but sometimes your faith journey is two steps forward and one step back. And yeah. You keep taking two steps forward. The only way to ensure that you take two steps forward is if you trust the spiritual disciplines like Bible study. So we're in God's word. We let him speak to us through that inspired and inerrant word. And we trust that our relationship is growing and our trust, our, our confidence in his promises are growing. Understanding that in our rest of our lives, you know, we're hearing other gospels. We're fighting temptations or whatever. And, and occasionally there are two steps or on a step back. But this is the process by which we continue to grow. It's a slow, organic uh, um, discipline of spiritual growth. Mm -hmm. All right, we are up to uh, not only episode 99, but Exodus, and we're going to look at two chapters today, 6 and 7, and again, I mentioned that as we get into certain parts of the Bible in general, certainly uh, spots like the plagues where there are, obviously there's a series of them, but like where you draw dividing lines for chapters is a little complicated, so sometimes we're going to smush a couple chapters together. And we're putting Exodus 6 and 7 together today. So make sure to read through your copy of Exodus 6 and 7 at home. And what we're going to do is I'm going to go through my paraphrase of 6. We're going to go through our first devotional thought. And then I'm going to go through my paraphrase of 7. And we'll go through the second and third devotional thought. Okay? Okay. All right. So Exodus 6, my personal paraphrase. God said that now is the occasion on which he's going to raise his mighty arm against Pharaoh. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he's always taking care of his people. Moses was to now assure the Israelites that God would deliver them from Egypt and bring them to the land promised to their ancestors. Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they wouldn't believe due to their dire circumstances. And God now told Moses to go and tell the same thing to Pharaoh. But Moses asked why Pharaoh would listen if the Israelites wouldn't. In other words, he's already tried to communicate this to the Israelites. They wouldn't listen. So what difference is it? Why is God having him go to Pharaoh? He, there's no way he's going to listen. Uh, Moses was again using the, the excuse uh, of his lack of eloquence. Mm -hmm. God spoke to Moses and Aaron and said he'd deliver the Israelites. The leaders of the tribes from the oldest three sons, Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, are then listed. Uh, with special attention given to the clan of Levi. And Moses and Aaron were both from the tribe of Levi. So it's just kind of a little side note packed mm -hmm. in there. We pick back up again uh, from before where God is telling Moses to go to Pharaoh and Moses doubts if Pharaoh will believe because Moses himself is a man of, un of faltering lips. And that's Exodus 6. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can you, what does your Bible actually say in verse 12? In verse 12, it says, of chapter 6, it says, But Moses said to the Lord, If the Israelites will not listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me since I speak with faltering lips? Okay, mine says I'm such a clumsy speaker. But in the notes, it says the actual translation, Hebrew translation is, I have uncircumcised lips. Yes. Can you explain that? Yes, it does literally say uncircumcised lips. What does lips. that mean? <laughs> we think it means faltering lips. That's why. What do you mean, though? Uh, like his lips have extra things on them so they don't work right? <laughs> Without painting too graphic of a picture, yes. That's uh, something about... So we don't know if his he actually has um, a physical condition mm -hmm. by which he has like a lisp or something like that. Oh, he has a lisp. Possibly. We don't know. Um, it, it sounds or very clear. stutters maybe. Yeah, or he's clearly making an excuse. So we all acknowledge it's an excuse. But remember, God works through weak things, not strong things. So uh -huh. like a speaker, the, the idea that you would be a uh, non-eloquent speaker going before the most powerful mm -hmm. man in the world is like preposterous. So maybe it was nothing. It, it might have been. Because wouldn't it be weird if he had this palace education, but they hadn't worked out a speech impediment? Yeah. Well, not necessarily. Some people have um, uh -huh. just because, like, so physically something might not work. I think of, like, uh, Stephen Hawking, you know, who has a condition where he can't physically talk, even though he's brilliant, obviously, right? He doesn't do any, physically do anything, though. I know, but that's my point, is it's not, it's not a lack of, he, he, yeah, can't, he can't just work on it. Okay. He yeah. might have a physical. He should work harder. <laughs> yeah, that's not the thing. Um, so Moses might actually have, 
a physical deformity, a speech mm -hmm. impediment that is uncorrectable, mm -hmm. or this might just be an excuse. Isn't that a weird thing to say though, uncircumcised lips? Yes. What it, in the, I mean, to, it to your point. It must have been a colloquialism. Yes. Nobody knows exactly what that means. Mm -hmm. um, and there's debate about it, but yeah. So without, without venturing into too graphically what that might mean, <laughs> I'd rather, like very clearly you get the idea. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like when we talked in Genesis about uh, the sisters, Leah and Rachel, and Leah had oh, yeah. weak eyes. It's eyes. clearly a colloquialism, mm -hmm. but does she have cross eyes? Does she, <laughs> what, you know, or is she just not attractive to the eyes? Uh -huh. You know, it's, don't know. We just don't know. Um, so here's devotional thought number one for the day. The Lord heals hears, feels, remembers, and acts. So that's the pattern. We see it again with the Israelites here. We're told he heard the cry of his people. He has compassion on them. He remembered his covenant with the patriarchs, and now he's going to act with his mighty hand. And that's a pattern that it's good for you to know in your life as well. Uh, I'd put it like this. Number one, you have to mourn this world. Um, that's the cry, the cry of God's people. You have to say, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Number two, you have to recognize his presence in this fallen world with you. He went everything through everything in Christ for you, but he doesn't, you know, he doesn't abandon you. He sends his spirit and he's going through this with you. Number three, you have to remember his promises to you for a better future and the strength to get through the present. And number four, you have to trust that he will act in due time. I... Every believer is at a slightly different point, but I think part of the process of conversion just in general is where a lot of people who self-identify culturally as Christian have not even gotten through the first first point. You have to mourn this world. This world has not has got to not be more appealing to you than the life that is to come. And there are a lot of people, again, born and raised in Christian families, baptized into the name of Christ. I'm not saying they're not a Christian, but they have not turned those gears yet. And they have not mourned this world in its present form and understood it's passing away. And the life that really is, is the life that is to come, which shapes everything in the present. Um, now, again, after that, it's okay. experiencing the presence of Christ, uh, trusting the promises of Christ, and trusting that you acting on those promises and trusting that in, in time he will act on those promises. But again, that's the pattern for God's people enslaved in Egypt. I think that's still the pattern for God's people yet today. Mm-hmm. Uh, anything else on Exodus 6? Um, no, I guess not. All right. So here's my personal paraphrase for Exodus 7 then. It says, God informs Moses again that he's going to bring powerful signs before Pharaoh. Pharaoh is going to harden his heart at first, but then be forced to let the Israelites go. Aaron will serve as his prophet. Moses, we're told, is 80 years old at this time, and Aaron is 83. Moses and Aaron went before Pharaoh, and Moses told Aaron to throw his staff on the ground, and it became a snake. Pharaoh's magicians were able to perform the same miracle, however, though, which is interesting. We'll talk about here in a second. The next day, Moses goes to Pharaoh again and warns him how the Nile will be turned into blood. All the fish will die, and it will stink when he strikes the river with his staff. Moses did as the Lord commanded, and in front of Pharaoh turned all the water in Egypt into blood. Pharaoh's magicians, however, did the same thing with their black arts. So Pharaoh hardened his heart and went inside. Meanwhile, the people of Egypt had to dig canals alongside the river to filter the water. That's my paraphrase for Exodus 7. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get into the frogs yet, which is, again, another thing in the English translation. I think the last verse of 7 has a line. Oh, no, maybe it doesn't. So the first plague is the plague of blood. Yes. Mm -hmm. Correct. Also, I just want it to be known that the translation for a serpent is dragon. Drag? Yeah. Neat. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think it... Um, I think there are definitely creatures that God created that we don't think were true. We... Dragons are aware of, if I'm remembering this correctly, scientists have uh, identified, I believe, 200,000 plus species that have gone extinct. Mm -hmm. Constantly, like every day there's different species going extinct. Yeah. Now, some, a lot of those are insects and mm -hmm. various birds and whatever. But the point is, like, 
the idea that there will be animals at one point in time that no longer exist, not only is that possible, like we know of at least 200,000 of them. Mm -hmm. So there's probably millions and millions of them, including potentially things that would be... It's also fascinating dragons. when you think about the fact that God created a limited number. Like he only created kinds, and then all of these different species have evolved like microevolution have evolved from the kinds that he created yeah so like that's amazing in and of itself that just like humans just like extraordinary humans. potential packed into a limited amount of kinds yeah mm -hmm. yeah um so why is it hard to believe that the offspring of the serpent okay well maybe that's not a good way to say it the things that evolved from the serpent would breathe fire yeah could happen oh absolutely yeah Cool. I'm picturing the little dragon in Mulan. Well, and even even then, the there's the debate about whether dinosaurs God, might have been dragons. The debate about whether or not God takes the legs off the serpent. Yes. You know, after the mm -hmm, fall, mm -hmm. there's yeah, lots of, lots of things packed in there. Um, we we again, point is, we should absolutely assume that there are probably millions of different species that mm -hmm. no longer exist, and that's we 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 have observed that the extinction of species. So. All right, devotional thought number two. Who are the plagues actually for? Like, who is the one that benefits from this uh, or is learning from this? Are they for primarily Egypt, who worships, as we mentioned, 80-plus uh, deities, uh, including Pharaoh, like so that they would know who the one true God actually is? Are they for Pharaoh, who perceives himself as a deity, and needs to see what a true God actually looks like. Are they for the Israelites? Who were told later on in Exodus 20, we're going to see how they struggle with worshiping the idols of Egypt. And they need to see who the true God is. The reality is it's for all of them. You know, like they mm -hmm. all benefit from seeing the mighty hand of God. And I think whatever plagues God allows uh, are for a variety of different people and a variety of different reasons. I make that application point right now in part because, you know, as you go through the 2020 pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people would, uh, let me just phrase it to you like this. What do you think? Now, there can't be a wrong answer here. Mm -hmm. What do you think God is trying to communicate to the world through the, you know, COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, I don't know. Um, maybe that you don't have control over anything like you think you do. Yeah. Okay, so lack of control, something so simple, so microscopic, mm -hmm. um, and you can't even figure it out. Like there's there's asymptomatic transmission. Like you don't even know what well, you can like, trust or who you can trust. One little thing happened, a virus, and you lose your job. You can't control your health. You know, a bunch of different things came from it. You demonize everybody else out there as you see them primarily as spreaders mm -hmm. who, you know, like you don't want to show com compassion to them. You just don't want to stay, you want to stay away from them. Mm -hmm. We realize like very clearly uh, substance abuse issues and anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. um, I just read something the other day that said one out of every four um, Gen Z uh, individuals has committed or has con uh, contemplated committing suicide in the past month. Mm -hmm. Like one out of four is an extraordinary percentage that we've never seen anything like quite like that in, since it's been recorded. Mm -hmm. um, that is insanely like people are not well. Yeah. You know, and so what are we learning? What's re what are we going to reemerge with? Like, I think the value of gathering, the value of being around mm -hmm. people. Um, I think the idea of human like fragility, mm -hmm. almost everybody, eventually everybody's going to know somebody who passed away from COVID, you know, certainly people who are affected by it, um, all, all sorts of things. But I just wanted to throw it out there because the plagues of Egypt, you know, that we, we talked about in a couple days ago, we talked about the fear of God. So and, yeah. So, you know, sometimes I think that I'm kind of a pessimistic person and I'll say things like, well, I'm trying to be more optimistic because I just really hate everything right now like i hate people arguing about wearing masks i hate people saying this is a, like a a hoax i hate social media like i just hate everything uh -huh. but i think it's what you talked about before like mourning the world yep. like things were not supposed to be this way like everything is just so divisive and used for wickedness yeah 
So if nothing else, the idea that people would not try to sink their roots too deeply into the here and now because this world in its present form is, is passing away mm -hmm. and you have to mourn that. You, the more you try to plan for your future and plan your perfect life and try to, again, the, if you stop thinking about eternity and only live for the moment, mm -hmm. um, it'll drastically impact your, the way you treat people. It'll drastically, uh, if you have, eternity is absolutely secure. Well, that'll indicate how you live in the present too. But what you believe about eternity, eternity drastically shapes your attitude and your actions in the present. And getting people to be more hopeful for eternity mm -hmm. and less hopeful for the present moment, mm -hmm. you know, I think is important. So lots of, it's not hard to imagine as a Christian, good things coming from this, but nobody enjoys it, mm -hmm. you know, so. Devotional thought number three, counterfeit miracles. I think I've always thought this was really interesting going back to, you know, like Sunday school and elementary school and hearing the stories of, well, wait a second, the, the magicians? Did mm -hmm. miracles too? Like, how is that possible? So uh, what we have here is, you know, first of all, the staffs that are being transformed into snakes. It's not only Aaron's staff, but uh, the Egyptian magicians are able uh, to do this too. We have the water that's turned into blood and the Egyptians are able to do that too. And even up to the plague of the frogs, mm -hmm. the Egyptians are somehow able to reproduce this as well. Um, they're, they're able to do similar miracles. You know, the same type of word is used here. And I think it teaches us two basic things. Number one, the magicians do have some kind of power. That's Satan, right? They're tapping into something. This isn't just, so I believe that the complicated word for this is ledger domain, which is just a word that means trickery. Um, but like, it, it's not just, um, it, they're not just illusionists. Uh-huh. They seem to be tapping into some kind of power beyond, it's not sleight of hand, trickery kind mm -hmm. of thing, uh, but rather they're actually doing something. Now, the, this shouldn't surprise us too much because the Bible does tell us, so this is, I, I think, super interesting too. The unbelief is not the absence of a gospel. It's, it's an absence of the true gospel, mm -hmm. but Satan doesn't just have nothing. Like he's not trying to get you to believe in nothing. There mm -hmm. is like a nihilism and, and whatever, but even that's not really technically nothing. It's counterfeit. Mm -hmm. So Satan, uh, essentially, he, he doesn't have no gospel. He has a counterfeit gospel. He doesn't have no conception of righteousness and human goodness. He has a counterfeit righteousness. He has counterfeit ministers. We're literally told he has a counterfeit Christ. Second Thessalonians 2 and amongst other places talks about the Antichrist. Oh, the Antichrist. Which isn't just somebody who is against Christ, mm -hmm. but the prefix anti means in place of. Mm -hmm. So it's somebody that Satan is looking to prop up that human hearts will follow rather than Jesus Christ himself. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, it shouldn't surprise us that it's not that Satan has no power. He has a counterfeit power. Uh, it's Now, it's, it's counterfeit, but it's nonetheless more powerful than human power. Mm -hmm. And therefore, he's doing things that humans in and of themselves can't do. It, fascinatingly, to legitimize this, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to Timothy in the New Testament, he actually mentions, in 2 Timothy 3, he, he mentions two guys, Janus and Jambres, mm -hmm. who are apparently famous uh, Egyptian magicians at the time. Mm -hmm. So, like, he's substantiating the fact that these are real things. So, the first thing is, there is a real power attached to Satan and his ministers that is more powerful than human power. Mm -hmm. The second part to it, however, is that that power that is greater than human power is nonetheless less than God's power. And so you notice like Aaron's staff when he throws it down, the, the magicians, they can throw down their staffs and turn them into snakes too. But mm -hmm. did you catch what happened to the magicians? Yeah, staff? the dragon ate the smaller dragon. Yes. The if good you, dragon ain't the bad dragon. You're hooked onto the dragon thing, <laughs> which is going to confuse some people. But the nonetheless, yeah, Aaron's staff eats the mm -hmm. the staffs, the snakes of the magicians. Like very clearly that's saying that, uh, you know, like a, a, a serpent or a cobra or a dragon or whatever in Egyptian mythology is a symbol of immortality. Mm -hmm. And it's showing that Aaron's god is bigger than any conception of uh, Egyptian god. You'll also notice that when Moses turns the Nile River into blood, the Nile wasn't just a river in Egypt. The Nile was a god. And it was actually uh, sort of controlled by other gods themselves named Hapi and Isis. And he changes the water into blood. Now, the Egyptian magicians can do something similar, 
but you notice what they, they can do a counterfeit miracle, mm -hmm. but what they can't do is they can't overcome the power of Moses' miracle. Well, they can't turn it back to water. So that's the thing. They can turn some water into blood, but why wouldn't they? The obvious thing that you would do at this point would be what? Yeah, turn the blood mm -hmm. into water, but they can't do that. They can't just get rid of the frogs. You notice they have to, eventually we're going to see they have to uh, burn the frogs. We haven't gotten to that plague yet, mm -hmm. but we'll, we'll save that for tomorrow. But the magicians can recreate a counterfeit miracle, but they cannot defeat the actual power that God is working through Moses mm -hmm. and Aaron. So I wonder if, yeah, it's interesting. I think it's, I think it's great because it tells us, it very clearly shows us, um, even amongst other human beings, mm -hmm. Your struggles are not against flesh and blood. Yeah. Your struggle is against the spiritual forces in this world. There is a power that exists in this world that is greater than human power. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Now, you don't have to be afraid as God's people because there's a power that's greater than that power. Mm -hmm. It's the true God. But you should be super humble knowing that you, even the smartest human alive and the strongest human alive, cannot defeat the evil forces and powers that exist in this world. Mm -hmm. So... We talked about supernatural realm and all that stuff in prior episodes. So, anything else about Egyptian magic, or I'm still thinking about it. You're still thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Well, we can pause. <laughs> we can give it a moment if you want. It's a, but it's honestly, it's something that I've but read. They through. have so much like faith that it would happen. You know, Who? the Janice Jop and Jop. Whatever their names are, <laughs> Janies and John Bray. Who are the Who are the dudes on Little Mermaid? Flotsam and Jetsam. Flotsam and Jetsam. Yep. Um, the it's possible that they've done something similar before, uh -huh. and God is showing. And they, obviously, they're held up as Egyptian yeah. powerful men. And maybe God is trying to say, to "Take me seriously. I can produce miracles like yours, mm -hmm. but my miracles are literally going to eat your miracles." Yeah. So, so he it's might have specifically just the demons doing this, right? It I it has to be That's something what black like magic that. Magic is, isn't it? Yes, it does not. Demonic a, power. It does not appear to be David Blaine, David Copperfield kind of mm -hmm. sleight of hand illusion. It seems like something truly is happening here, and um, yeah. So it's um, yeah, it's very clearly I, I for the same reasons that like. You know, I think as a kid, when I heard the miracles that God gave to Moses, mm -hmm. okay, you're gonna, your staff is going to turn into snake and your hand is going to be put in your cloak and you're going to take it out and it's going to be leprous mm -hmm. and, you know, like that kind of thing. I, I think I just thought those were just random miracles. I thought the same thing about Jesus' miracles, mm -hmm. you know, like turning yeah. water into wine and yeah. walking on water and healing the lame. And this, I thought they were random parlor trick kind mm -hmm. of uh, miracles. But there's a specific purpose attached to them. And I think part of it is the Egyptian magicians mm -hmm. have already addressed this thing with serpents before. Yeah. And so he specifically wants Aaron to produce a serpent that eats their serpents. You know, I would love to know how many demons there actually are. A lot. But even, I know it's so many, but even then, that was only one third of all the angels, right? So that means yes, there should we... be much more, many angels it's it's just it, working on our it's behalf great perspective because we are we cannot stand the battle mm -hmm. ourselves so we should be extraordinarily humble but we have so much good working on our behalf that is bigger than the power that's bigger than mm -hmm. than us and therefore we should be extremely confident anything that yeah. makes you both more humble and more confident absolutely makes you a better person in the world mm -hmm. the so I never had a problem with like spiritual forces. It was something that we talked a lot about at church growing mm -hmm. up. Yeah. And I also read these books. If you like, I mean, they are fiction books, but they talk about the supernatural, the Frank Peretti books. Yeah. I've never read any of them, but oh, I know they're that you've really mentioned good. a lot. Yes. Yeah. And um, like really give you an, uh, an interesting, like eye-opening perspective on how demons probably are working and like the things going on behind the scenes. Yeah. I haven't read them in a while, so no one yell at me if there's... <laughs> Controversial. Yeah. Naughty language or whatever no, else. No, I don't... That there's, I mean, they're Christian books, but... No. All right. Well, let's close the prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you again for being with us today in our study. We see that even when you're working for us, 
that doesn't mean the circumstances all get better immediately. Uh, there's so many different ways that you're working on our behalf right now where we're tempted to do, like we're inclined to just complain and say, oh, I thought you loved me. I thought you were going to help me. I thought you were, and you actually are doing that, but you're being a God, the God of all the earth and the God of all people and working all things out for our good in a way that is just and fair and generous and gracious. Forgive me, forgive us for ever thinking that we are capable of judging you for the way you're operating, including through this whole COVID mess. Lord, we just have no right to question any of that. Um, help us to trust you more in it, praise you more in it, and uh, watch you work your mighty hand uh, for all things for our good. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for studying with us. We will see you tomorrow for episode 100.